In the previous episode of this series, we pulled the actual computer portion of our Centurion mini computer out of the rack and put it on the bench and pulled all of the individual boards out to take a look at them in a little more detail. And there were uh, nine boards in total, including the back plane. And based on how the chips were laid out and kind of what the cards were supposed to be doing, I took some educated or <laughs> uneducated guesses as to how this thing was working on the inside, but I was well out of my depth and I knew that going into it, but you guys stepped up to the plate and knocked it out of the park. You guys left some of the most amazing comments. I was just blown away and I had so much fun reading all the comments. You guys really kind of started to shed some light on how this thing was working on the inside. But by far and away, the most common comment was to try and find a way to save the data that is stored on all of the ROMs. And this makes total sense. I was, I was really planning on doing this from the get-go anyways, because the data that's stored on those ROMs is irreplaceable. I mean, this is all very custom Centurion code stored on these ROMs, and if one of those chips goes bad, that that, that code is just gone. I can't ever get it back. So I wanted to try and get the code off of those ROMs. So that's what we're going to do in this episode. And so I've got the boards that actually have ROM chips on them set out on the bench. So let's hop over to the bench, take a look at what we got to tackle, and then we'll see how we're going to do it. So let's hop over there and get started. Of the nine boards that are in the computer, these four boards are the only boards that actually have any ROMs on them. And some of them are pretty obvious, like the uh, ceramic chip down here was a ROM, and then we have rows of ROMs here on both of the uh, CPU and CMD boards. Um, but there's actually some much, much smaller ROMs, like physically smaller chips, that actually threw me for a loop at first. Uh, for example, this uh, small chip up here on the back plane is actually a ROM. So the best way to get the data off of these ROMs and stored on the computer as a backup is to use something called a ROM programmer. And the most recommended ROM programmer that I see is the TL866. But these boards are pretty old. And looking at the TL866 uh, device compatibility list, none of the ROMs that I needed to dump were supported. So the TL-866 was out of the question. We had to look at something else to get the data off of these ROM chips because, well, if they're not supported, they're not supported. But a good friend of mine got in touch and said uh, that he had a Zeltec, I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce it, but it was a 1600 Pro ROM programmer. And this thing boasts supporting thousands and thousands of devices. So if there was going to be a ROM programmer out there that we could use to dump the ROMs, that was going to be it. So I made a pilgrimage up to his place and we started trying to dump the ROMs and we were only about half successful. <laughs> Uh, we were able to get the small ROM chips to go. These are all TI chips, but we were able to find some equivalents for them and get those dumped. Although there's not hardly any data on them, so I don't really know if we got those right. I may have to look into that in the future. However, we were able to successfully dump all of the ROMs on the CPU board up here. Uh, however, the ROM chips on the CMD board, the big ones down here, we weren't able to get the data off of. So I'm going to have to get a little inventive to get the data off of uh, this ceramic IC and these ICs down here. But what we do have is we have saved data for these ROMs up here. So I can use one of these ROMs to build my own ROM dumper from scratch. And then when I pull the data off of that with my own ROM dumper, I can compare it against the data that we got from the proper ROM programmer. And if they match, then I know that my DIY solution is working and then we can use it on these. So I have a plan about how we're going to build a ROM dumper. So let's pull the breadboard out and get to building. All right, I've got my breadboard here and I've got two things populated on it already. The first is an Arduino Nano and the second is our AMD AM27S191. Now this chip uses 11 pins for the address, so it has a, an 11-bit address. So we need to build a 12-bit binary counter. And for that, I'm gonna use the 74LS161. This is a cascadable four-bit binary counter. So I'm gonna put three of these in place, cascade them together, and that's going to give us our 12-bit counter. So let's go ahead and get those chips on the breadboard. 
All right, and then we'll go ahead and hook up power and ground for each chip. All right, and the way I'm going to use these 161s is that this one on the far left is going to be our lowest most four bits. This one's going to be the middle four bits, and this one's going to be the highest most four bits. And so this one will essentially be counting all the time, and it will cascade into this one, which will then cascade into this one. And in order to get that cascade working correctly, we need to hook up the count enable parallel input and the count enable trickle input. And this is going to be pins seven and 10. And on this uh, lowest most four bits here, we just essentially want it to be counting all the time. So we're going to pull those high. And then while we're on this top right corner, pin nine here is a parallel enable input, and this is active lows. And so we wanna pull this high for all three chips so that we're not actually loading a value into them. All right, so we pulled the CET and CEP pin of this first chip high, but for these next two chips, we actually wanna connect the CET and CEP pins to each other. So I'm gonna run a little jumper to connect those up. And then the CET and CEP pins that are now connected together will be connected up to the terminal carry output of the previous chip, which is going to be pin 15. All right, and then pin one is the reset. So we're gonna tie all of those together. And the reset is an active low input. So we wanna pull it high normally. So I've got a little 1000 ohm resistor that will hook up to do that but uh, there's gonna be a time where I want to actually pause counting and that's gonna be at the very beginning. So I want to have uh, counting paused and the chips held at zero initially. So uh, what I wanna do is I wanna pull this uh, master reset pin low. So I'm going to set up a little toggle switch with the jumper to ground to do that. So that way I can uh, essentially just pause counting with the uh, toggle switch. Now pin two is our clock and we wanna tie the clock for all three chips together as well. So I've got some uh, jumpers that I'm gonna to use to do that. All right, now that we've got both of those tied together, both the clock and the master reset are going to need to go back to the Arduino here. And that's because the Arduino itself is going to supply the clock. And when the switch is in reset, we want the Arduino to essentially be on pause. So we want to have the reset signal being an input into the Arduino. And then to make sure that the clock is actually clocking, I'm gonna put a little LED right here so that we can see when the clock is active. All right, so these uh, counters should be pretty much all set up. So if we were to put power into it and put a clock into it, we should be getting uh, 12 bits of counting going on, but there's uh, really no way to see it. And it would be laid out kind of funky because the uh, lowest significant bit is going to be on the far left here. And the most significant bit is going to be on the far right, which is backwards to how I conventionally think about it. Um, but I want to set up some LEDs so I can actually see the 12 bit count happening. Um, so that's a good chance for me to rearrange the wires so that they're more traditionally with the least significant bit on the right and the most significant bit on the left. And then the LEDs are going to need some dropper resistors so that we uh, don't burn them out and that they're not too bright. So I've got a bunch of 10,000 ohm resistors here, which might be overkill, but uh, that was what I had on hand. All right, so we have a row of 12 outputs here and I wanna see those on LEDs. So let's go ahead and hook some LEDs up. All right, and then the backside of those LEDs all need to go to ground. And uh, while this may not be the most efficient way to do it, it's the way I'm going to do it with <laughs> just a, a bunch of small jumpers. All right, now that we've got the LEDs all in place, let's get the binary count output from these three chips up to here. So now we need to start hooking up our ROM chip over here. And first things first for a ROM chip, let's go ahead and hook up VCC and ground. And VCC is going to be pin 24 and ground is going to be pin 12. But there might be some times where I want to double check that this is working without the uh, ROM chip here being powered up. So I'm actually going to put pin 12 on a toggle switch itself. Now this ROM chip has three control pins. They are G1, G2, and G3. And they are on pins 20, 19, and 18 and G1 is an active low. So we need to pull G1 low and we need to pull G2 and G3 high for the ROM chip to be outputting data. Okay, and then the only pins left are going to be the address in and the data out. And so the address in is going to be on pins one through eight and then pins 23, 22, and 21. 
and pin 8 is a 0 and pin 21 is a 10. All right, that's our 11 address lines in. So if we were to power it up and give it a clock, uh, we should have uh, an 11-bit address coming into here, and that should give us some data on the data output pins. But those data output pins aren't hooked up in anything, so let's go ahead and hook those up to our Arduino up here. All right, and then the final piece of the puzzle is that we want the Arduino to share ground with everything else. It's actually going to get its power from the computer because we're going to uh, plug the USB in, but if the ground isn't shared, we could get some read issues. Uh, so there we have it. We've built a uh, ROM reader. Well, I, I think we have. Uh, we still need to test it. And so what we need to do is we need to uh, pull the computer out, write some code, hook it up, flash it to the Arduino, and hopefully we'll get some data coming out of it. And then we can cross-reference it and see if this thing actually worked. So let's pull the laptop out and see if it works. All right, well, it's the, uh, it's the next day already. Uh, I spent a lot of time trying to get the code working uh, just right, and I think I've got it. We're gonna give it an actual proper test. So I've got my breadboard set up here with my Arduino ready to be plugged in through my USB cable. And then on my laptop here, I've got the code pulled up. So we'll take a quick look at the code just to see what it's going to do. Then when we plug it in, we'll see if it actually works. So on the code here, we have a bunch of uh, integers that we declare at the very beginning. This is just setting up the pin modes. Now I have two more integers that I set up. One is count and one is new line. And these are used for ensuring that we only toggle the clock as much as we need to and for punching in a new line for our serial data output. Below this, we have the setup. We set up all of our pins for input and we set up the uh, clock pin for output and then we set that clock pin to low. So the clock is starting low. And then below that we go into the main loop. So essentially what we're going to do is we're going to count from zero all the way up to however many different address possibilities that we have. And so with uh, this AMD chip that we're using, it has an 11-bit address and so that's going to be 2048 possibilities. Now we declare a new integer called sum right below that. And the sum is so that we can take whatever the eight bit binary data that's coming into our individual pins and turn it into hexadecimal. And so we do this by just reading each of the input pins. And if one of those pins is high, we add whatever the equivalent binary value would be to the total of our sum. Now below that, what we're going to do is we're just going to print the sum in hexadecimal onto the serial monitor. And then after that, we just toggle the clock high, then toggle the clock low. All right, that was the code. So let's go ahead and plug the Arduino in. This is going to connect it to the computer and hopefully allow the serial monitor to start showing us data. So let's go ahead and put power into the rest of the system and that's being supplied by these extra wires up here which are coming from just a wall wart that's right at five volts. I think um, we're ready to give this a shot. Now when I flip this toggle switch, we should see the serial monitor fill up with the data in hexadecimal that's coming off of our ROM chip here. So let's give that a shot. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Look at that, it's just streaming out the data off of the ROM chip. And there we go, it finished. So I think that's all of the data that was on the ROM chip. We saw our LEDs counted up exactly like they were supposed to and it stopped exactly where it's supposed to. Uh, the data looks like viable data. Um, so there's really only one way to check this data and that's to compare it against the data that we already have from the ROM programmer, the official one, that we used the other day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, look at that. The data looks identical. That is awesome. We actually managed to build something to rip all of the data straight off of the ROM chip and store it here in a hex editor. So all we've got to do now is get in the chips that we couldn't pull the data off of, change up our address lines and our data lines so they match the pinout of those chips, and then run our Arduino code again so that we can get all of the data off of those chips. So I think this is gonna work like gangbusters getting the data off for us. But there's only one way to find out and that's to just get into it. So let's, let's hop to it.
Well, that was a resounding success. Everything went super smooth. I was able to pull the data off of the ROM chips on the CMD board with absolutely no problems. I was mostly worried about this little ceramic chip here. This is quite an old ROM chip and it uses a little bit of a weird voltage. It has a plus five volts and minus nine volts. But I had the data sheet here, which told me what each pin did. So I just pulled out uh, two wall warts, plugged it all in, updated the Arduino code, and the data came straight off with no problems. Now, whether that data that came off of this uh, ceramic ROM here, or rather any of the data that we got out of any of the ROMs is still good and valid data, uh, I, I don't have a clue. The data for this uh, ceramic ROM chip in particular is right here. And uh, we can see that there's some data stored in the first part of the chip and some data stored in the bottom part of the chip. And then there's just nothing in the center part of the chip. So I don't know if that's by design or if that means that we have some vintage bits that have run away. But uh, a lot of the ROM chips seem to have large swaths of uh, empty space in them. Um, so we can see that this was this one here is one of the the other chips and you can see there's a large section right here in the middle that are just uh, 0101 repeating so uh, I have absolutely no idea what any of this data means but I have a backup of the data as it sits before I put any power into the system and so that's good news so I'm gonna upload the data and put a link in the description below to where it is. So if any of y'all are curious, you can download all of the ROM files that I have and take a look through them. So hopefully you guys found this video fun and interesting and entertaining. And if anybody out there has a weird ROM chip and they're looking for ways to get the data off of it for backup, uh, this seemed to work pretty well. So feel free to use the code for my Arduino here, although it is a bit hacky. So there's probably some people out there who can write a much better program for this. Uh, but also feel free to download and look through any of the ROM files and maybe even use them for your own restorations. So in the meantime, I've got a lot more work to do before this is ready to go. I've got a bunch of capacitors here that I think I'm going to replace, but that'll be it for now. So thank you guys so much for watching and I hope to see you in the next episode.